This video is intended to be a companion to other Joseph's recent videos about textiles and about the Swadeshi movement, which was a movement for national independence in India that was based largely upon domestically producing textiles instead of importing them from Great Britain. If you haven't watched those other videos, I would recommend you check them out because they'll contribute to your understanding of this video. However, I am trying to structure this video in such a way that it will make sense and be interesting regardless of whether or not you've seen the other videos. So what I want to do in this video is I want to describe what I regard as one of the most brutal and unforgiving obstacles to anyone who's interested in economic independence, self-reliance, home production, or anything like that, or as we like to call it sometimes on this channel, cottage industrialism. That obstacle is the economic theory of comparative advantage, which states that you should specialize instead of diversifying your productive activities. Now, the theory of comparative advantage is absolute kryptonite to anyone who's interested in economic independence. And so naturally, if you, like me, are the kind of person who's interested in self-reliance and things like that, it's an incredibly important theory to understand, and it's incredibly important to understand why it is such an obstacle for independence. And then it's also important to try to understand ways to get through the problem or maybe around the problem. So that's what I want to do in this video. Now, comparative advantage is a strategy for allocating productive capacity, either for an individual or also for larger collective social groups like a nation. Comparative advantage states that you should choose whatever productive activity gives you the most output for the least cost as compared to all the other productive activities you could be engaging in, and also compared to everyone else's best productive capacity options. Or in less technical language, you should choose whatever you're going to do. You should choose one thing, you should get really good at it, and you should not be splitting your efforts between many different activities. The mathematical justifications for comparative advantage show that this focus strategy will give you a higher output for less cost. Uh, both you individually and also the economy as a whole will have higher output for less cost if everybody in it follows the strategy of comparative advantage. In other words, if you try to do it all yourself, you will always end up behind compared to where you could have been, and also behind compared to everyone else, and also everyone else will be slightly worse off as well. Now, notice that this is a strategy that most people employ individually for their own careers, and it's also a strategy that is followed by larger social groups like corporations and nations. Most individuals will specialize in a single profession rather than doing lots of things. They will do one thing, they will be paid for it, and then they will trade that surplus for all of their other many needs and wants. Now, corporations also generally follow this same strategy. Apple, for example, is not well known for its line of lawn furniture. And the theory of comparative advantage was originally devised for situations of international trade. David Ricardo came up with it while contemplating whether Portugal and England should produce their own wine and cloth or produce a surplus of one of those two and then trade with the other. The important point here for us is that comparative advantage is a strategy that deliberately cuts against independence. The two are in conflict, the two are in tension. Comparative advantage asserts that independence implies economic loss. If you diversify your activities in order to be more self-reliant, you are incurring economic costs. You are laming your own productive capacity. Economic independence, according to the theory of comparative advantage, is self-mutilating and self-destructive and it will put you at a disadvantage compared to all other producers in the market and also put you behind of where you could have been. So if you do want to be economically independent, how are you going to justify that in the face of the theory of comparative advantage? I see four basic strategies you can employ, and I'm going to go through each one in some detail. So first, you could accept the theory of comparative advantage and decide to make economic independence and self-reliance a hobby. Now, this is the strategy that many individuals follow in today's world. They'll work a 9-to-5 job to gain the benefits of comparative advantage and specialization, and then they'll use all or part of their spare time to engage in some other productive activity, like gardening, selling crafts on Etsy, sewing, raising llamas in the backyard, or what have you. Now, the lives of million attest that this can indeed be a very good strategy, and I certainly think it can be a very good strategy. However, if you do have a strong emotional affinity for independence and self-reliance, then this strategy isn't going to appear very satisfying. This strategy basically guts economic independence of all its force as a general adaptive strategy and relegates it to the place of a mere sideshow hobby. So that's a potential disadvantage of this approach. Now the second strategy, you can accept the theory of comparative advantage and decide that taking the economic hit to gain independence and self-reliance is worth it. Now you might do this for reasons of personal taste, or you might also do it so that you're more resilient in the case of external shocks. 
If you're doing it for reasons of personal taste, you might, for instance, recognize that you incur economic losses by refusing to specialize, but you enjoy that economic independence enough that it is justified in your mind. For example, you might recognize that uh, it would be more efficient, it would be lower cost and higher output uh, for you to buy your dress, but you like sewing and you like designing clothes, and so you decide to sew and design your own dress. Now, if you choose the second strategy for reasons of resilience in case of external shocks, then you probably understand that your strategy of economic independence is poorly adapted in the short term. However, you believe that in the long term, uh, it is actually well adapted, it actually is efficient. If the economy crashes, you know, you still have your kitchen garden in the backyard and you still have your solar panel on the roof you're gonna be just fine. Now, many individuals employ this kind of strategy in one way or another, and again, I do think that this can be a good strategy as well. However, there are some evident potential disadvantages. If you choose to take an economic hit in order to gain the personal satisfaction of economic independence, then you are essentially admitting that independence and self-reliance are luxuries. Now, granted, they're luxuries that you can afford and that you have chosen, but they're luxuries. Again, it's not a general adaptive strategy. Instead, it's a bonus thing that you can add on to the generalized strategy of comparative advantage. If you choose to take those economic losses in the short term for reasons of resilience, you understand and you accept that you are poorly optimized for the short run and that you are only optimized for rare tell events. In other words, you need to be ready to do a lot of losing along with your winning. Third strategy. You can push back on the theory of comparative advantage and use either moral and psychological reasoning or else economic reasoning to try to put some limits on the scope and power of comparative advantage. And those arguments aren't particularly hard to make. I mean, presumably we could extract greater productive capacity out of humans if we worked them for 16 hours a day, forced them to take sleeping pills every night, and fed them via intravenous drips so that they would never have to take meal breaks. However, it seems very likely that pushing humans to these kinds of limits would actually ruin them and that that kind of system would result in total collapse. It would not be feasible over the long run. And even if it was possible to physically optimize to this degree, that kind of lifestyle would probably be repulsive to our human sensibilities. We don't actually want to be fully optimized machines. We like fresh air. We like genuine friendships. We like spontaneity. We're not piano keys. For those reasons, pushing back on the limits of comparative advantage seems like a very attractive strategy. However, it's a very complex and murky strategy as well. The reason why is because it's not clear exactly how far back you should or could push back on comparative advantage. Should we be specialized enough to work 40 hour work weeks or should it be a 20 hour work week or a 60 hour work week? Should we all have two professions instead of one? How would that work? It's also possible that specialization could yield different returns in different kinds of productive activities. Um, for example, it might make a lot more sense to learn how to cook than to learn how to design microprocessors. Comparative advantage also might offer differing returns based on how deep into a particular productive activity you go. For instance, knowing how to change your oil probably gives you a much greater return as a sort of secondary side activity than does learning how to maintain Formula One cars. So even if comparative advantage does have limits, which it certainly seems to, we're going to have to figure out what exactly those limits are, and that isn't going to be easy. And there's also no reason to assume that wherever those limits shake out, that those limits will suggest that economic independence is necessarily the optimal generalized economic strategy in any particular given case. Now there's a fourth strategy I can think of, and it's quite different from the other three, and it's one that I have a lot of instinctual affinity for. You could actually lean into comparative advantage and consider it an asset instead of a liability. Rather than seeing modern economic relations like employment and trade as inherently suspect and always worthy of suspicion, this view would see them as potential sources of personal power and stability. They shouldn't be shied away from under this view. Instead, they should be studied, they should be understood, they should be managed, they should be improved upon. And they're fully capable of that. This strategy tells us to not view ourselves as victims of some kind of oppressive social institution, but instead to view ourselves as fully participatory co-creators in those social institutions. And this view asserts that those social institutions properly cared for and managed and sustained are actually the greatest possible source of long-term stability you could have. Now, this kind of strategy has been employed in the real world. It was employed on an international level after World War II. 
the Allies, rather than destroying everything in Germany and Japan and sowing salt in their enemies' fields, instead they invested huge amounts of resources to rehabilitate and rebuild both of those nations. It's precisely because of this strategy that Germany and Japan are advanced productive nations with good laws, good relationships with the international community, and wonderful trade partners. The post-World War II rebuilding of Germany and Japan shows that Although, yes, good fences can make good neighbors, it's also very possible for good neighbors to make good fences. In fact, since we're on the subject of World War II, I think you could also very easily build a case that there is a tendency for the desire for economic independence to pathologize into hostility and warmongering. Japan's pre-war expansion into Southeast Asia was largely motivated by the desire to secure raw materials like rubber and have them firmly under imperial control. Nazi Germany's invasion plans for places like Norway and Russia were driven and motivated largely by the desire to secure oil fields. Examples like this aren't limited to World War II either. You can go back to the Crimean War and see many of Russia's decisions being motivated by the desire to have a warm water port under their control in the Black Sea. And in our own day, North Korea actually has a very independence-oriented economic policy called Juche. These examples show the real danger of ignoring the social value of comparative advantage in an indirect but very real way. Comparative advantage is the reason why South Korea is lit up at night and North Korea is not. Of course, this fourth strategy of leaning into comparative advantage obviously has its own potential downsides as well. You absolutely can be cut off at the knees if those relationships turn sour. However, I do find myself drawn to this fourth strategy. I think it has a lot of value, particularly ignored value, particularly in a time like ours where, to say the least, social stability is not at its absolute peak. I strongly suspect that what we ought to be doing is finding ways to shore up and repair these social institutions rather than devising ways to live without them. That said, I did mention all four strategies because I do think that they all have their pluses and minuses, especially in different contexts. If you'd like to leave a comment, what I'd really like to know is what you think about the conflict between comparative advantage and economic independence. How do you negotiate the tension between them, particularly in different areas of your life? And do you see yourself as employing one or more of those four strategies that I laid out? If you do want to comment, I'd love to hear it. I think it's a really interesting question that can generate a lot of productive conversation. If you like the video and want to help support us, you can, of course, like and subscribe and comment. And if you'd like to, you can also donate at goodandbasic.com. Thanks, as always, for watching, and we'll see you next time.